is Yahweh, the God of all creation. His name is Jesus. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. He is Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. He is the King of creation. And we are gathered here this morning to worship a name that is indeed above all names. In fact, I know you're anxious to sit down. I know you're ready to sit down. But before we even read our passage, I want to remind you of Proverbs 18, 10. 10. The name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous run to Him and they are safe. I hope you have come to find Him today. And I know you're ready. I know you're ready, excited about God's Word. But would you greet somebody before we read even? Would you tell them God is in this place? standing today you know one of the greatest privileges that we as followers of Christ have is the knowledge that knowing Yahweh himself God himself is with us in this room and this morning as we get to read his word please stand I want to read two passages Genesis chapter 11 verse 8 and 9 it says so the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth And they left off building the city, therefore its name was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. One more passage for us before we sit down. In the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 7 says, And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? mean and today that's what we're going to talk about so would you join me in prayer today father would you give us wisdom as we seek your word would you give us encouragement as we try to understand your name better holy spirit would you fall fresh in this room today would you allow every soul that is here those watching online today be enriched encouraged blessed by your truth and by your word lord jesus you are in this place right now you are with each and every one of us. And the name of Yahweh is our strong tower. So we run to you today, Lord. Would you fill this room with your presence? That every man and woman, every child in this room today would receive from you precisely how you want them to ref- be refreshed, renewed, and encouraged, Jesus. In your holy and precious name I pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. How is everybody doing on this beautiful day? Man, I'm so glad you are here. Hey, if you have your Bibles, please open up to the book of Genesis chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, make sure your hands are up. Let our ushers bring you one. And if you are using your digital devices, please make sure you silence them. Before we even start, I do want to give you further reading. If you're interested in reading further to understand what we are talking about a little bit better today, I want to put this on the screen for you guys. I would encourage you later on to read John chapter 17, the whole chapter, the prayer of Jesus for his disciples. And also read Acts chapter 2, the whole thing later on as we relate it to what we're going to be talking about today. But also as we get started... Nick, our youth director, did an amazing job last week covering the genealogies <laughs> of, uh, my goodness, what an amazing passage he did cover. He did a great job. But I got to tell you this, last, uh, two Mondays ago, the week Nick preached on Monday, my daughters didn't have a school, so they were in the office with us. And as I was sitting at, at my computer doing non-preaching related stuff, my oldest daughter comes to me and she says, well, daddy, you are not preaching, so what's your purpose? It, <laughs> And, you know, to be honest with you, at first it did offend me because here I'm thinking to myself, you know, you raise these kids, you give them food to eat, you give them shelter, you give them a house to stay in. And 
they come and challenge your purpose. But to be honest with you, I think the words that she spoke were, were from God to me to examine certain things in my own life. And I begin with this because God spoke to me that night as I was, spe- as I was having my time with Him, doing my journaling and quiet time with the Lord. The Lord spoke to me that night and He reminded me from His Word that if I try to seek my purpose and my safety from what I do for a living, if preaching is merely a job I do, and for you the same thing, if what you do is merely your safety, then you have no safety at all. But if your safety comes from the Lord, the name of Yahweh, then you have everything you have ever needed. Then you can serve or do whatever you are supposed to do without being challenged or discouraged. So I want to really ask you today the question, and I think it's a very important question for us to ask ourselves, where does my safety come from? Does your safety come from your identity? Does your safety come from the business that you have built to your own name? Does your safety come from your family members, from your relationship? Does your safety come from the inheritances you have received? Does your safety come from what you do for a living? Or does your safety come from the Lord? Do you really challenge yourself to figure out where do I find my safety from? And as I was preparing for this message, I, I really w- we're going to talk about the Tower of Babel today. Familiar story, many of us have heard it. I wanted to figure out what does the world have to say about this passage? What does the world around us think about this passage? So I googled the Tower of Babel in Wikipedia, and it's inter- or in Google, and, and the the results are very interesting. I don't know if you can see this, but I've highlighted most cultural things. Look at this story we're going to look at as mythological story. It is not a truthful story. That's what the world believes. And here's the interesting thing. If we believe that this story in Genesis chapter 11 is merely a myth, and I get it why people would want to believe it. Because if we believe it, there isn't much that we have to change about ourselves. But if we believe that this is the Word of God and it's actually a truthful story, that means our condition is a lot worse than we think. That means that we actually have a lot to change about ourselves, and that's what we're going to look at today. And I want to give you a few lessons today to see where does your safety really come from as we try to explore this. But let me ask you this. Is there anybody excited about God's Word in this house today? All right. I'm excited. If you have your Bibles, okay, open up to Genesis chapter 11 again. I want to start with verse 1. Now, after the genealogies, we're going to get to this story, and it says, but we are still not done with genealogies, okay? But today, we're going to just talk about nine verses. Verse 1 says, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. Let me pause here for a moment. It says, the whole earth was united under one banner of one language. This is significant detail that you and I are being given, meaning that the world had the unity of being able to understand one another, that there was no confusion in the sense of, you know, now we have to use Google Translate if we are talking to other people. We have to find interpreters to help us understand one another. We can't even sometimes understand each other in this country because of the weird accents that some of us may have. But, but if people had one language, and they had one language, and they could understand one another, but that was not sufficient for them. It was not sufficient that they were one people under God, made in the image of God. And that's where really it begins. And verse 2, it says, and the people migrated, and as the people migrated from east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and butamen for mortar. Important verse, verse 4. I want to make sure you're paying attention to this. Are you with me on this one? Important verse. And they said, they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower. Come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed on the face, over the face of the earth. So if immediately you are given a few details attached to this, the people gather to build a city and a tower. Now the city and a tower are important details. Why? Because a city always resembles where we find safety. If you look at historically, a fortified city is where people would run to when there was war. The enemy would try to break the walls of a city when he tried to enter, when they tried to enter. City always resembles safety. They come and say, let's build ourselves a city 
And then a tower, because a tower is also a place of shelter to run to so that you could hide from whatever is going on outside. If there's a storms going on, if there are things going on, you run into a tower. So they say, listen, let's build ourselves a city and a tower that reaches to the high top of the heaven. Now I'm going to come back to that word, top of the heaven, later. But then they said, let's do this to build a name for ourselves. Important detail. The name for ourselves means that they are not satisfied with being or having the name of God, the name of Yahweh, cover them. The name for themselves means let's build something in our own image, a city in our own image that resembles us, that is our safety, where we dwell in, where we find our safety in it. Let's build something that resembles who we are. Now, I want to give you three lessons. That's all I got for us today as we apply this to our lives. Three lessons from this, but lesson number one, if you're note takers, uh, write, write this down. Proper safety is not a matter of what you build for yourself, but who you build it through. And I, 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 I hear you, I, I understand some of you say, well, I already know that. But do we really? I mean, look around us for a moment. When we try to build a name for ourselves, how many of us try to build, what does this culture tell us? Build a name for ourselves. Become famous. Become somebody known. Make sure you are, make sure you have a big bank account to your name. Make sure you have things left for you. Make sure you are somebody who is somebody. That's what the culture teaches us. And whatever you build in your own name, that's what I want you to understand. If it is not built through God, it is a waste of time. It is a waste of time if you're not allowing God to build it for you. If you're not building whatever you're building through God. In fact, Psalmist says in Psalm 127 verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build, build the labor in vain. Unless the Lord Yahweh watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. You can build, you can prepare, you can have all these things that you have. If it is not done in the power of God, you have wasted your time. Now, are you still with me? But notice it says, verse 4 again says, they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower. It is top reaching the heavens. Let me pause right there. It is top reaching the heavens. Now there is some, some arguments about what this means. Does this mean that they want to build something really tall that they get? And there's literally scholars debate about this related to ancient historical things, structures and all that. But I look, I try, I, I told you this a few weeks ago. I said, I try to think, th take things as literal until I can prove them otherwise. Their idea is let's build something that reaches to heaven. So either that God would come down to it and, or we would be where God is. And it's very interesting. You know what else does that? Religion does that. Religion comes and says, let's get ourselves to a high place. Let's be people that are holy so we reach above everybody else. Now, you look at the religions in the world. For example, the Islamic leaders, they gave themselves the title Ayatollah, which means the word of God. Let's build ourselves to a place where we are higher. So they begin this structure building to get to heaven, to reach where God is, to either surpass God or to be closer to God in their own ideology. But if I could learn one thing important from this is this, that we don't have to really reach to God. God always reaches down. In fact, note, if you're a note taker, listen number two, proper safety is not about aiming to reach God, but trusting that He has already reached down to us. You know, it's interesting as I tell you this, Maybe, maybe some of you, you've forgotten this. And you're trying so hard to reach to God. You're trying so hard. You're like, it seems like the communication is just not working. There's no reception there, it seems like, to you. But I want to remind you today, you know, we have been in this series, 11 chapters so far. And just looking at this, let me give you some examples. Let's see if you remember your Bible stories. You know, remember when Adam and Eve fell? The scripture says in Genesis chapter 3, I don't have it on the screen, you can read it later. It says in Genesis chapter 3, it says, Yahweh came down and walked in the cool of the garden and asked Adam, where are you? Now, if you remember when God told Noah, I am sending a flood because God had seen the wickedness of man. It says God came down in Genesis chapter 7 and he shut the door of the ark so that they would be safe in it. Later on, we're going to see when we get to Genesis chapter 12, it says, Yahweh came down. Yahweh himself came down and talked to Abraham and said, you're going to have a son and he's going to be the seed of a savior. You're going to see in Genesis chapter 32 when we get to it, it says, Yahweh came down and wrestled with Jacob and changed his name to Israel. You're going to see in Exodus chapter 3 where it says, Yahweh himself presented himself as the burning bush so that 
so that Moses would be intrigued and said to Moses, you're going to go save my people because God reaches down. And then I could go on and on and on and tell you, but it says in Philippians 2 verses 7 through 8 that Yahweh himself reached down by emptying himself, taking the form of a servant, being born to the, in the likeness of man, and being found in the human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Why am I telling you all this? Because the name of Yahweh is a strong tower. If you are righteous, made righteous in Him, you run to His name, and that's where your safety really comes from. And if you have not understood that, you're going to keep building, you're going to keep trying, you're going to keep trying to reach to the top of the heavens, and you know what's going to happen? Confusion is imminent. Destruction is imminent. You still with me? Now verse 5, to the end of the chapter, one of the things you're going to notice in your Bibles, most translations are going to have the word Lord capitalized, all letters. Now this is important. In this story in particular, it's very important because every time you see the word Lord, it's actually the word Yahweh. And the reason I bring it up is because the great I am is really mentioned. And here's our focus today. The name of Yahweh is a strong tower. You can build a tower. You can build a city. You can build everything you want to your name. But if it's not done under the banner of the name of Yahweh, it's a waste. So you guys with me? Amen. Verse 5. And the Lord, Yahweh, notice this, this is powerful. What did he do? Then the Lord came down. Now, this is interesting. Before I read further, this is interesting because also, keep that on the screen for me, because also a euphemism, okay? It, it's almost a sense of mockery because it says they are building this tower that is reaching the top of the heaven, and, and it's almost like the scripture says God measures the universe with his span. He holds the universe in his hands. And God's like, what are they building? It's so tiny. So puny, what is this little thing they're building? And that's what you, what you build like, looks like. The name you build for yourself, the towers you build in your own name, the bank accounts that you have, all of them are puny little things that you build. It says, then the Lord came down because God, God reaches down to us. The Lord came down and as he came down, he came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. Now verse 6 causes some problems for people. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Now, some people read this, say, hold on a second, God is threatened by mankind. <laughs> because he says, well, look, look, they can do whatever they want now. Now, here's the important thing to realize. When you connect the scriptural references together, you realize that God has no reason to be threatened by us. But if you remember, it says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, God saw that, the, it says, then the Lord, or Yahweh, saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of his thought, the thoughts of his heart was, was evil, only evil continually. It says, God saw that everything that we try to touch brings corruption. Now, interesting thing. It says, God says in these verses, it says, God says that now from now on, whatever they pr propose to do, they can do it. Any evil we choose, choose to do, guess what? We will do it. Look at the world right now. Look at the world we are in right now. We try to pass bills that are of wickedness. They get passed. We try to justify murder. It gets passed. We try to justify whatever it is. It gets passed. Why? Because everything we propose to do, we will do it. Because our intentions are always evil. What does this teach us? Lesson number three, my last lesson. We're not done yet though, okay? But lesson number three. It, write this down if you're a note takers. Proper safety is knowing that without God, we are always on the precipice of failure. Without God, we are always on the edge. We are always standing on the edge to fall off the cliff. That's what we're doing without Jesus. Unless Jesus is really with you and holding you and grabbing you, say, son, daughter, don't go through that. You're going to keep falling. Without God, we are always on the precipice of failure. That's why in John chapter 15, Jesus is talking to his disciples and is teaching them. says, hey, if you remain in me, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. And he says, apart from me, in verse 5, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can't bear fruit. Apart from me, you can't be anything on your own unless you are with me. This is not God saying you're useless. It's God saying I have made you to be mine. Yes. You're still with me? Yes. Now, verse 7. So God says, after seeing this, God says, let us go down. And I could preach on this for a long time, but that's not my focus at the moment. God says, let us go down and therefore they confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord, important word, dispersed, come on, let's try this one more time. So the Lord, 
disperse them, so the Yahweh dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city, the strong tower and the city that they had built, they left it off. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. And from then we also see, this is Nasser's perspective theology, that people keep on babbling. That's what happens. We're babbling nonsense all the time, and culture is confused all the time. We see from there that God says, you know what? They try to reach to the top of the heavens. They try to build a name for themselves. Let me show them that they can't. Unless, unless I am with them, they can't. Now, it's interesting because some thousand years go by. And I'm gonna, I want to talk to you for a few moments about Easter story, okay? I know you're thinking to yourself, hold on a second, this is not Resurrection Sunday. I told you a few weeks ago, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday if you're with Jesus. So a few thousand years go by, and in the midst of all this, humanity keeps on trying and trying and trying and trying, building a name for himself. That's all we try to do, build a name for ourselves. We build big cities, build big towers, and the chaos and the commotion of the culture becomes worse and worse as time goes on. I mean, we look around us, and all we see is disaster. All we see is brokenness and hurt people. And some thousand years later, as humanity had reached at that time, had reached this peak of wickedness, this time God reached down from heaven, but not to confuse, but he came as a form of a baby. And he grew up, God, man, grew up, and he walked among humanity. He walk, walked in the midst of the corruptions of the governmental authorities on each side, and he saw the corruption with his own eyes. He walked in the midst of these temples and the shrines and the idols that humanity had built to build a name for themselves, and he walked in the middle of them, and he saw all of it with his own eyes as the God of the heavens and the earth. He reached down, Yahweh himself reached down and walked in the middle of humanity, and he saw the corruption that humanity was in. And in the midst of all that corruption, death and murders and wars, God picked, handpicked a few people to be his disciples. Now, why am I telling you this part? Because if you're sitting in this room in this very moment, you have been extended the same offer to be with Jesus. Handpicked by the power of a mighty God, say, follow me, because if you follow me, the name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous will run to him, and they are safe. And as, as people followed him, as these disciples followed him, Jesus constantly told them, listen, I am going to die on the cross for you guys. All you do leads to confusion and destruction, but if you remain in me, you can do amazing things. If you remain in me, you're going to see the power of God. If you remain in me, you're going to be powerful just like I am in the ways that honor and glorify God. And, and Jesus told them, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to die on the cross for your sins. And as he's getting ready to die on the cross for their sins, we get to John chapter 17, and important. I want to make sure you're awake. So if you have been sleeping, here's where I need you to wake up, okay? So Jesus is praying for his disciples. And in John chapter 17, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I would encourage you to read it later on. But in verse 6, Jesus says, I have, he's speaking to the Father for his disciples. He says, I have manifested important your I have manifested your name to the people. I've manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and, they, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me. And they have received them. And I've come to know in the truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. Meaning they have believed that the name of Yahweh is a strong tower. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world. But for those whom you have given to me. For they are yours, all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father, important, important, keep them in your, which you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your, which you have given me. Let me pause right here. Jesus prays, he says, listen, the name of Yahweh is what I came to introduce to these people. The name of Yahweh is the place where we should run to. And a few, few days, a few moments later, Jesus is arrested. They take him to 
a place called Golgotha. Before that, he's prosecuted, he's beaten, he's flogged, he, he's, he's mocked, he's spat upon, they slap him in the face, they put a crown of thorns on his head, they put a sign on off his, his cross, they nail him to the cross, a sign saying the king of the Jews as a sign of mockery, but they don't know they're actually speaking the truth in that sense. And as they put that sign on him, they nail him to the cross, Jesus speaks the word, says, it is finished. And he breathes his last breath, and then they take his body down, and they put his body in a tomb that was made for a rich man named Joseph. What is interesting is, you know the story, but we're going to talk about it because it's, again, resurrection for us, right? They put him in the tomb. Three days later, the ground shakes. The angels ascend down from heaven because God reaches down. And as they ascend down... They roll the stone away, and the king of glory walks out of the tomb. That's what he does. And as he walks out of the tomb, important thing happens. The women see him. Then he shows himself to the disciples. The scripture says over 500 people see him, and they are amazed and, 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 and wondering what is going on in the midst of all of this. And as they see the king of glory, what is amazing in the story is later on, some days go on, they're in a place called Galilee, and, and they see Jesus ascend to heaven. That's where they see him being taken into the clouds. And that's they're watching this in amazement. I don't know if they knew this or not, but a prophecy is being fulfilled that not many people talk about. A prophecy is fulfilled in Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. It says, therefore, wait for me. Wait for me. This is the Lord's declaration until the day I rise up for plunder. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms in order to pour out my indignation on them. All my burning anger for the whole earth will be consumed by the fire of my jealousy. Listen to this. For I will then restore pure speech to the peoples so that all of them may call on the name of... Yahweh and serve him with a single purpose from beyond the rivers of Cush, my supplicants, my dispersed people will bring an offering to me. And as they see him go to heaven, it says, the scripture says some days later, they're sitting, about 120 or so of them are sitting in a room waiting for God to do something. And that's where we get to the book of Acts. And I'm going to finish with that in a moment, okay? We're almost done. You get to the book of Acts, and it says in chapter 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost, by the way, that's two Sundays from now. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind because God reaches down to his people. That's what he always does. Mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began, began, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Remember what had happened before? For division, different languages. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this, at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? And he says, it goes to list it for you just in case you didn't get it, how many people are there? There are Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongue the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed saying to one another, what does this mean? All right, I spoke 30 minutes to come to this point. What does this mean? This is what it means that Jesus came to reveal the name of Yahweh to you once more. That you would be able to say the name of Yahweh is a strong tower. Because where there was confusion, where there was brokenness, Jesus came and said, I will bring my people back together. And did you notice this? As the Holy Spirit ascended down, reached down, it fell upon all of them. Each one of them began to hear in their own language where there was division. God brought unity once more. Here's what I want to finish with this. Last thing I promise you. But if you're a believer today in Jesus Christ, this leaves you and I with two challenges. Challenge number one, claim God's name while making his name known. What does that mean for me, for you? What does it mean? It means that it doesn't matter what you're going through in your life right now. 
It doesn't matter if you are dealing with mourning and sorrow. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with uncertainty in your life. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with problems, with chaos, with family dilemma. If you're dealing with joyful moments, whatever is going on right now in your, in your life, make sure that the name of Yahweh is on your lips, not as a cussing or, or profanity, but the name of Yahweh is being spoken as sounds of praise. The name of Jesus is on your tongue saying, Jesus is king over all. Let the nation see that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we will run to the name of Yahweh who is a strong tower and we will find safety and shelter in it. That's our challenge. Challenge number two is this, that we are supposed to be ambassadors for the reversal of confusion. Did you notice that when the Holy Spirit comes down, everybody begins to hear in their own language the good works of God. Do you know why people are confused? Because they don't know what God is doing. And you and I are called to be ambassadors of reversal for that. As the Spirit of God reaches down, He reaches through us. To go to the people who are confused, say, come, find safety. And that's our purpose. Our calling, our safety is in that. To say, Lord, we want to reveal your name so that through you and me, one day, the words of Philippians 2, chapter 2, verses 10 through 11 would come alive where it says, so that at the name of Jesus... Did you notice that? Whose name is that? It's the name of Jesus, Yahweh himself. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At the name of Jesus, you can build a name for yourself. But your name will not cause anybody to kneel. Your name will not cause anybody to shake. But at the name of Yahweh, the armies of hell will run. At the name of Yahweh, the armies of demons would vanish. At the name of Yahweh, there is safety, there is security. In the name of Jesus, there is victory. In the name of Jesus, there is the reversal of confusion. In the name of Jesus, there is hope. In the name of Jesus, there is mercy and grace. In the name of Jesus, there is provision. Are you calling on the name of Yahweh in this place? Because I am telling you, if you are looking for safety elsewhere, you won't find it. You will only find confusion. So where does your safety come from? You know, there's this old song. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to Him and they are saved. I've been listening to it all week. I'm not going to sing it for you, but it's called Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. Look for that. And this week as you depart from here, I'm telling you, the world is going to throw everything at you saying you don't need a call on the name of Yahweh. That's what the people thought. Let's build a tower in our own name. Let's build safety for our own selves. And they did. And they found no shelter, no safety. They found confusion and dispersion. But today we are in this place. And God says, not only are they in this place probably, but they're under my name. The name of Yahweh. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Wonderful, mighty, Prince of Peace. That's our God. And if this morning, if you don't have a relationship with Him, if you have been calling on every other name, today is a day to change that. If you've been trying to build a name for yourself, maybe you have been going to church all your life, but yet all you have been doing is build a name for yourself, build a bank account for yourself. Build a business for yourself and you have forgotten that it needs to be under the banner of Yahweh. Today is the day, come say, God, I, I want it to be yours. I want to be yours. And I'm telling you this, this is not a warning or something to scare you, but it could be our last chance. He could be coming back any moment. Yahweh is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And he could be coming back any moment. This may be the last opportunity we get to change something. So as I pray, our prayer warriors will gather up here. This is our opportunity to pray. Our opportunity to call on his name. Our opportunity to bless his name. Would you call on the name of Yahweh? Would you allow the name of Jesus to be on your lips? 
And if you need prayer, come pray for anything. It doesn't matter what you need prayer for. Here's the thing. The name of him is a fortified, strong tower. Run to his name. And we can do it together, running toward him. So if the Holy Spirit leads you, you know, one day we know every knee will bow. I would rather my knees bend right now before him. If the Spirit leads you to kneel before him, kneel before him. If he leads you just to raise your hands or sit quietly, praise him in this moment. Holy Spirit, we call upon you. Would you rush down to this place? Would you fill every heart with your joy, with your wisdom? Would you fill every one of us with your thoughts? Would you change our speech, Jesus? Would you change our speech that the name of Yahweh would be on our lips? That no matter what happens throughout the week, no matter what struggles we may go through, no matter what chaos we will face, we would call upon the name of Yahweh, run to you and find our shelter and security in you, Jesus. Would you help us to know that there is only hope in you? Lord, and so this world around us, it's interesting that we come here in the safety of the church together. But then we walk out of here and the world is in chaos and commotion and destruction and wars and evil and wickedness, addictions. And yet here we are, the agents, the ambassadors of transformation. Another reminder that God himself has reached down and as the spirit of the living God dwells inside of us, we get the privilege to reach down to our neighbors, to our friends, to the broken people and say, run to the name of Yahweh. There will be safety. So would you give us the opportunity, the eyes, the speech and the utterance through the spirit of the mighty God himself, Yahweh himself, to be able to speak to those who need to hear you today. And throughout the week, Jesus, we give you glory. This is your bride. This is your church. And these are your people. Bless them this week. In the name of our Savior, I pray. Amen.